Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Aloha and welcome to this week's edition of Business in Hawaii. I'm Daylan Yanagita and we're broadcasting live from the Think Tech studios in Pioneer Plaza in downtown Honolulu. If you want to tune in live, we are at www.thinktechhawaii.com and there you may also subscribe to our programs or get, into, get onto our mailing list. The theme of Business in Hawaii is to share with you stories of local businesses by local people. Our guests share with us how they're able to build successes in our challenging business environment. In the studio with us today is Kevin Henry. Kevin is the Volunteer Engagement Manager and Encore Fellow at Child and Family Service. Welcome to our show, Kevin. Thank you very you much. Got quite the title. In fact, you've got two titles. I know, I can barely fit it on a business card. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, <laughs> why don't you tell us about Child and Family Service? Child and Family Service has been on Oahu for over 117 years, and we provide over, I think there's over, up to 45 programs now, or more, and all of these programs uh, focus on serving and assisting what I like to call vulnerable populations. Our slogan is, one of our slogans is from uh, twinkle to wrinkle, and that we have programs that uh, help infants, uh, parents uh, with small children, small children themselves, um, older adults, uh, adults, people who are dealing with different types of challenges in their lives. So in some cases it might be more economic. So we have people that uh, come to our donation center, our EVA Family Center, and actually shop for donated items. We have counseling for um, victims of sexual child abuse. We have a domestic shelter for um, survivors of domestic violence, an alternative high school. So we have a wide array of programs to really try and meet the needs of the community. So we were talking earlier, and Child and Family Service is a nonprofit organization. Nonprofit, right. Um, that's not directly affiliated with the Department of Health, is that correct? Right, even though we do have contracts where we have certain programs where we have contracted, uh, we are contracted to provide a particular service. We also get donations, um, we get grants, um, and other funding sources as well. So you have a varied background um, from radio broadcasting to, uh, I understand, a very sophisticated position uh, with the Sophisticated, city. I like that. <laughs> with the city of I'll Bellevue. use that sometime. <laughs> The city of Bellevue, Washington. So, uh, Tell us what you, you, you said that you're familiar with Bellevue, Washington, because you were in the Northwest. So, I worked for the city of Bellevue, Washington, a suburb of Seattle, for about 20 years. And I helped create and manage the cultural diversity program for 20 years. And thankfully, it's still going on and, and going gangbusters right now. And that involved really bringing different factions of the community together to uh, promote understanding, collaboration, to ease tensions. The reason why, or one of the reasons why the, the program was uh, seen as, a, as something that uh, was needed was because the demographics were changing. So Bellevue was one of these cities that, you know, in 1970 was 95% white. Today it's like more like 61% uh, or 57% white. So there was this influx of immigrants, um, people uh, of different uh, nationalities, backgrounds, languages. And when that happens, there's a certain amount of isolation that can happen because people don't connect. So my job really was to put on events, seminars, workshops, cultural events to educate people about different cultures, to bridge those gaps to also encourage and increase workplace diversity so that when people came to City Hall, they saw the people there as a reflection of the community, which was, you know, meaning that that would be a very diverse workforce. So I'm, I managed to uh, fortunately apply some of those tactics and strategies to this position as well. So with your experience in cultural sensitivity, if you will, mm -hmm. building that in the city of Bellevue, how do you compare that to Hawaii? Where are we? Hawaii are is, well, first of all, Hawaii is very refreshing. In fact, what's interesting is that I'm still very much in tune with what's going on on the mainland. And there's a lot of, you know, controversy and, you know, there's political stuff going on and polarization and 
you know, I go on social media and people are unfriending each other and yelling and screaming and, you know, and typing furiously. And, and I come to Hawaii and I go, oh, oh, I mean, I've been here for four years, but it's like I talk to somebody in Hawaii and it's like, hey, did you hear about the police shootings? And it's like, what? What's going on? You know, um, people here are very diverse. I love the diversity of Hawaii. I love the aloha spirit. Um, I really feel, and I'm not saying that there aren't issues between groups. Um, which, you know, need to be addressed. But I really feel like I'm, in my four years here, I've been really very much treated as an individual. You know, it's about relationship building and my background. It's not that it's not seen or recognized, but it seems secondary to making that connection on, on a positive level with someone, if that makes sense. Absolutely. But I love the diversity here. We, and we are, we are that diverse group. I think culture is paramount mm -hmm. to our interests, not just in community and personal lives, but in business as well. Right. Um, so tell me about your two roles mm -hmm. at Child and Family Service. First of all, the uh, volunteer engagement manager. Yes. Volunteer engagement, what is that about? What is that about? Well, I am trying to engage volunteers, and that means there are people out in the community. And by the way, we have offices on the Big Island, Maui, and Kauai as well, in addition to our main office on Oahu. And we have some facilities on Oahu as well. But there are people in the community that have value. There are people that have skills, they have knowledge, they have wisdom, they have time. And that's who I'm trying to engage because we have, as I said, from twinkle to wrinkle, we have small children, we have adults, we have older adults. All of these people can benefit from somebody spending an hour a week, 10 hours a week, connecting with them, helping sort donations, help, helping um, talk to kids about careers, uh, helping in a variety of ways. In some cases, we have volunteers who they just want to help out by working in the office. They're more behind the scenes people. So what I do is, is go out into the community, go on social media, have meetings with people, do public speaking to various business groups, various other groups, senior groups, to tell them about child and family service and really emphasize how valuable they can be to uh, helping us achieve our goals of serving the community and giving back to that community. Um, what I like about the volunteer program too is that I like to say it's kind of a menu of, of different options. In some cases when you want people to volunteer, you have one thing that you want them to do. You know, every, every Tuesday from one to five, they sort out, the, you know, they file something and then that's it in a little room somewhere. We have like, you know, 10, 15 different ways you can volunteer. You can volunteer one hour a week, 15 hours a week. It's really up to you how much time you have and want to commit to um, you know, giving back your time to uh, child and family service and the people we serve. So in your role, you recruit, recruit volunteers for Oahu programs or? Um, mainly when I first started this program about, I guess it's, it'll, be, well, it'll be two years this summer. I focused on Oahu. I was trying to kind of take one island at a time. Now, uh, in the last three or four months, we've been kind of branching out to some of the neighbor islands because what will happen is, for instance, with the, um, the thing that's going on with the volcano on the big island, there was a need for volunteers to go and give out information, resource information to the residents there in certain, certain areas. So the need uh, has grown a little bit on the neighbor islands. And so now that I've got kind of a core group on Oahu, I'm kind of branching out to Maui and kind of seeing what they need in Kauai and the Big Island as well. The program, I might add, is split into two areas in, in the sense that anyone over 18 can volunteer. But there's a special program called Encore, which we'll get to in, in a minute, which has a focus on engaging people who are over 50 to uh, be volunteers at Child and Family Service. So how many volunteers does it take to make your operation work? Well, it really varies. It's kind of a hard question to answer just because it's a variable. I mean, it, the more volunteers we have, the more we can do. And we have volunteers that kind of come and go. I mean, there's a kind of a, a transitory nature to it in that I've had several volunteers in the last two years that have moved back to the mainland. Some of them are military, so they're here for two years, one year, five years. So right now, I think there's a core group of probably 15 volunteers 
that are, are basically based on Oahu, and then there's a few on the, on the neighbor islands. But a month from now, that could be 20 or that could be 10. So it really varies. Uh, but we feel that if, even, even if we have one volunteer, we're able to accomplish something, even by having them come and help in the donation center. Because for instance, we get so many donations that they start to pile up, you know, and it's like the staff can't even get to all the donations. And so those volunteers uh, play a really important role in, in helping facilitate how that donation center works. There are a number of nonprofits here in Hawaii, and I'm sure that a lot of them struggle with the recruitment of volunteers, mm -hmm. especially with the low unemployment rate. But right. these, but the volunteers are crucial to making the the services mm -hmm. happen. Mm -hmm. um, tell me about some of the effective things that you do to mm -hmm. recruit volunteers. Well, what I found is that. Hawaii is the same in some ways as my work in Seattle and Washington State in that it's really about relationship building. Now, I think in Washington what I noticed is that I think I could send out more unsolicited emails to people I didn't know and engage them. Here it's really about, you know, getting to know people. So very often I've gone out and spoken to groups. I've gone to like, I remember going to a retirement center in Kapolei and talking to some of the seniors there about recruitment. Um, it takes time to get, get to know people. And I think there's a certain amount of trust and credibility that's built up. So then when you start to meet some of the key people in the community, they then refer you to other people. Unlike me sitting there just sending out random emails to these groups that I find on the internet and getting no response, which is what was happening initially. <laughs> I was sending out all these emails and it's like, well, nobody's emailing me back. But then I wind up sitting down to coffee with someone and they go, oh, I got three volunteers for you right now. And boom, you know, next week they're in the office. So what I found is just getting out and talking to people um, and listening. Because what I've found is that sometimes, you know, a lot of people have jobs where you work eight to five, and you, you turn your brain on, you go into work, five o'clock you turn your brain off. You don't think about your job until eight o'clock the next day. With me, I've met people standing in line at the supermarket. Um, I've met them in, you know, the hot tub at 24 Hour Fitness. Because you get into conversations with people, and then they mention something. And they go, oh yeah, you know, six months from now, I'm gonna be retired, I wonder what I'm gonna do. So it's much like, I think, a marketing person who has a product to sell. I mean, if you run into, you know, if you're a car salesman and you happen to be in Safeway one day on a Saturday when you're not working and somebody says, you know, my car just broke down and darn it, I'm going to go buy a new car in the next week. Well, if you're a salesman, you're going to go, whoa, what's that, you know? Uh, hey, here's my card. Let's talk about this. You're not going to just think to yourself, well, I'm not working right now you know, until eight o'clock on Monday. So I think it's having a certain mental frame of mind is that once you open the door and leave your house, potential volunteers are everywhere, just like customers if you had a business. Uh, why is volunteerism important to our business community? I think for a variety of reasons. I think that for one thing, the volunteer group that I um, have right now is very diverse. And I think it's really important that if like, if you have a business, for instance, and you know, I'm not saying you're not successful at your business, I think having an influx and input from different perspectives from different people can really enhance you on a personal level, but more importantly, it can enhance your business because you're, you're not getting tunnel vision. I mean, I've run into some businesses that are somewhat rigid, not so much here, but back in Washington. And it's like, well, we've, this is the way we've done it for the last 20 years. And I said, well, have you considered you know, do, changing your marketing strategy, changing your strategic plan, you know, things like that, changing the training that you have? Because if you look outside, the world doesn't look like it did 20 years ago a lot of times. So volunteers, I think, bring new ideas, fresh ideas. Um, one of the things that we focus on in um, our Encore program, which we'll talk about, is having youth and older adults collaborate. Because sometimes people think, well, I'm 17, what have I got to say to a 62-year-old? You know, well, well, we're setting up circumstances and programs uh, by which those connections can be um, made, and the, the benefits are, are mutual, I think, the, those types of connections. Great.
Uh, we're going to take a short break, but we're going to come back and talk about the second part of your job right. as an Encore Fellow. Right. This is Business in Hawaii. We'll see you back here shortly. Hello, everyone. I'm DeSoto Brown, the co-host of Human Humane Architecture, which is seen on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. And with the show's host, Martin Despang, we discuss architecture here in the Hawaiian Islands and how it not only affects the way we live, but other aspects of our life, not only here in Hawaii, but internationally as well. So join us for Human Humane Architecture every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. Are you tired of sleepwalking through life? Are you dreaming of a healthier, wealthier, happier you? You're not alone, and that's why thousands of people tune in each week to watch R.B. Kelly on Out of the Comfort Zone, Tuesdays at 1 p.m. Make a change, get the help you need, and stop sucking at life. Hey, Arby, we're about to go live. Oh. Hello, it's 1 p.m. on a Tuesday afternoon, and I'm your host, R.B. Kelly. Welcome to Out of the Comfort Zone. Welcome back. This is Business in Hawaii, and today we're talking with Kevin Henry from Child and Family Service. We were talking about volunteerism mm -hmm. and its importance to the business community. I think mm -hmm. there are benefits for the, the volunteers, but mm -hmm. as well as for the businesses. Tell us a little bit more about that. Right. Um, one thing I was, I was mentioning uh, before we came back was just that sometimes volunteers are your future employees, because in a lot of cases, you, when you have a job opening, you, you know, go through the resumes, you set up the interviews, people come in. In some cases, you might know the person or have a good referral or whatever. But if you have a volunteer, you actually get to see them in action. So you can see their work style. Um, even people at Child and Family Service, have start, some have started out as volunteers and wound up being employed. So there's that advantage of being able to see somebody and how they work and how effective they are and how they get along with the dynamic of you know your workforce, so you can get you can get kind of a preview of what this person would be like as a future employee. So that's another advantage to having volunteers. Uh, In so addition to saving money, there you go. So there, I'm sure there are volunteers of all ages. Um, a lot of times in 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 high school. Uh, even in college, we encourage um, students to um, seek out volunteer opportunities mm -hmm. to device, device, diversify their resumes. Um, and then you have those who have entered the workforce, and then you have those in the, the, the older portion or the non-traditional workforce. So volunteerism in each of these groups, what do you have to say about that? About like youth, for instance? Youth? Mm -hmm. um, I really encourage youth to do some volunteering because as you mentioned, you know, a lot of times I, I've gone like to Campbell High School and different high schools and talked about, you know, okay, you're senior, you're going to be graduating, you're going to start looking for a job. You have a blank piece of paper as a resume. So if you can put volunteer experience down, that's just as valuable as paid experience, especially if you can show that you were there for a while, what you were able to do in terms of the, the, the duties that you performed, and then you get referral letters so that when you come in for that first meaningful job, or just any job really, you have something on a piece of paper. In addition, it, it also uh, provides networking opportunities. Again, you know, if you might be a 17, 18 year old teenager, you come to work for my company, I get to see, hey, this person's really sharp, they're bright, they're punctual, they're reliable. And then when that job opening comes about um, you know, six months down the road, that's the first person I think about. So it's an investment of time and I really want to encourage it. I mean, I know youth want to make money. I, I wanted to make money when I was 16. But um, if you can make money, and even if you're volunteering three hours a week, rather than sitting there, you know, playing video games or something like that, doing something, investing time into something that won't produce anything, uh, go and start networking and volunteering at a local organization. You never know who's going to, um, you know, help you reach some more important goals later on. It's not always what you know, but who you know, who knows you, right? Uh, some of the other people, like you, you had mentioned, like non-traditional groups, sometimes I've spent a fair amount of time convincing a volunteer that they're of their value. And what I, what I mean by that is sometimes when initially 
when I meet with a potential volunteer. They come in and I say, well, you know, we're doing these career talks where we're talking with uh, survivors of domestic violence about you know, how to go into a bank and open a checking account. They, have, they need to know that. And sometimes the person's a little uh, you know, nervous. Well, you know, I've never worked in a bank. I, I'm not an expert. You don't have to be an expert. You have information that's valuable. If you were a janitor for 25 years, you have something to give. So sometimes the challenge sometimes is convincing the volunteer of their value because their whole idea of volunteerism is something that's maybe a little narrow and needs to be widened. Um, business people, uh, business people are great because a lot of times business people, a lot of businesses have something built into their business where their employees are supposed to devote a certain amount of time to volunteerism anyway. They tend to be the easier ones. Uh, we've had business groups that have come and done like a cleanup and, a, and repainted the inside of one of our shelters, for instance. They you know, travel around these groups and do that. Um, I think, again, some of the harder groups might be, you know, retired housewife, well, you know, because I've heard more than once, well, what do I have to give? What do these teenagers care about what I have to say? You know, well, just your life experience about, like, talking about dating, you know, or what, what to, you know, look for in a potential, you know, life partner, things like that. One thing I will say about being older is that you've accumulated a lot of knowledge. You made a lot of mistakes. And if you can help someone younger than you avoid some of the potholes that you stepped in, um, it's a win-win situation. In addition, it adds value, especially with the older adults in the Encore program. It adds, it builds self-esteem on the part of the volunteer. It adds value. Studies have shown that people that get retired um, or have retired, a lot of times are more prone to depression. You add to that, like a spouse passes away, the kids are all gone, maybe you don't have grandkids, you have all of a sudden you have this time on your hands. You know, you don't get up every morning at six o'clock and go to work and come home. You have nowhere to go. So it's, it's a little scary for some people, and it's a little depressing. So there's a whole untapped market of adults, and especially older adults, who have that time. They have the knowledge, they have some experience, and we really want to tap into that. And it's also uh, um, a win for the potential uh, volunteer or Encore volunteer as well. So let's back up a little bit and yes. tell me how the Encore program came about. What, were you, were you filling a need? How did that come about? Yeah, the Encore program is a national program all across the mainland. There are Encore people all over. There's organizations. In fact, we're part of a, of a smaller uh, group of 10 nonprofits who all received funding to run Encore programs at our individual sites. So there's uh, an organization on back east on the mainland, in San Francisco, Philadelphia, all these different cities. Uh, down south, I think, I believe in Houston, we, uh, there's another organization down there where an Encore fellow was hired to recruit more Encore talent. So um, it's a national program. We also are very um, uh, putting a fair amount of energy into just having people reconceptualize what a volunteer is. Because again, I think people get stuck into this, well, a volunteer is somebody who comes, you know, and files. Or they come and put the chairs away after the church service. Or they, you know, there's a very narrow view of that. So we're really trying to even use like technology as a way to uh, uh, connect people. So with Skyping and things like that, a program I'm hoping to get started is called Skype a Mentor. So it means that the, the kids or the teens or the adults for that matter on Kauai and the neighbor islands we can set up a Skype call where somebody can talk about a particular uh, career. You don't have to be in the same physical space um, to collaborate and benefit from information you might receive. Oh, that's going to be amazing. Yeah, yeah. So That really will. Yeah. Um, so you're an Encore Fellow. How do you become a Fellow of the Encore program? Well, um, usually what happens is, in the case of this particular, uh, it's called the Gen to Gen program, meaning just you know, intergenerational, generation to generation. So, for instance, if you had, um, to answer your question, an ad could be put out. So, an ad, if I'm in Houston, I have an organization, I have a position for an Encore fellow to run this Encore program, I might hire um, 
through a, per, through a classified ad. In my case, I was already working for CFS. So I was just kind of offered that position because it melded really well into the fact that I was doing community outreach anyway. Um, in some cases, um, there might be some other more traditional ways of hi actually hiring someone. But then once you hire the Encore Fellow, then they go out and recruit the volunteers. However, there's also um, an emphasis on finding employment for people over 50. So you might have somebody who's over 50, hey, I want to volunteer for a while, but ultimately I want to get a job. So both could happen. They could volunteer hypothetically for five months, and then they could be hired by the same organization, or perhaps they could just be hired by the organization and as a result of some outreach done by the Encore fellow who was hired. That all makes sense, hopefully. <laughs> so how many um, volunteers do you have in the Encore program right now? All together? All together. Oh, I. Oh, I, I, Hawaii. Yeah. In Hawaii, um, I think at last count there was about eight. We have about 15 volunteers, and of the 15, eight are Encore. So it's kind of split almost in half. And I hope to increase that number. It has been bigger, it has been smaller, depending on who's had to leave and you know different. Uh, factors that people have had to deal with that have forced them to leave the island in most cases. So why would folks over the age of 50 mm -hmm. want to be interested in joining up as a volunteer for the Encore program? Well, we were talking about this earlier, and I think that, you know, there's things, we mentioned the word passion, there, there's things in all of us that resonate with us. In some cases, it might be the environment, cleaning up the environment. In some cases, it might be making a difference in the life of a child. Some cases, it might be uh, helping organize an event. We all have that somewhere. My task is to find in those persons what is what pushes your button. What do you have a strong enough passion about where you you would think I'm going to volunteer my time? There's usually something that everybody would do because let's face it, we don't work 24/7. There's things that we do after you know, uh, we're home from work or on the weekends. But what are those things? You know, a lot of cases it's more fun oriented, but fun can, can come through volunteering as well. I mean, so, I mean, there's for instance an organization called Access Surf, which goes out and helps people with disabilities go surfing and, and do things on the water. You know, and I went out there and it was like almost brought tears to my eyes because I'm thinking, you know, wow, I, for one thing, I have nothing to complain about when my aches and pains, you know, I'm, I'm in reasonably good health. And these people, here's somebody that has two, uh, is missing two legs, but they're on a surfboard. So I think that also on a personal level, um, people can really be inspired by the people they meet, especially if they're less fortunate. You know, I think it really helps your perspective in general when you see someone that's really overcoming a challenge. I have one uh, general volunteer who, who's legally blind. Wow. She's 19 years old, and she's a student at UH. We're just about out of time, but why don't you tell our viewers, um, if they're interested mm -hmm. in volunteering with the Encore program, how they can reach you? You can call 808-342-2516, or you can go to our website at childandfamilyservice.org. We are out of time, Kevin, but I wanted to thank you for spending time with us today. Amazing program. I'm sure there are a lot of nonprofits out there who are definitely looking at volunteer engagement and what they can do to recruit volunteers. So thanks for sharing that with us. Thank you for having me. I wanted me. to also extend a big thank you to our production staff, amazing production staff here in the studio. If you would like to be a guest on our show, please email your information to shows at thinktechhawaii.com. Business in Hawaii airs every Thursday at 2 o'clock, and we look forward to seeing you here next week.